external, or in Kid's house, courtyard, noon. In Kid all set for his journey, stands facing Ninsekil. My dear, I'm sorry, but this time I can't bring you along. Ninsekil gives him a meaningful look. I know you've been through a lot. To make it up to you in some way, I'd like to give you a gift. He offers her a gold bracelet. Put it on. Inkid helps Ninsekil put the bracelet on her delicate hand. She examines the bracelet. In the distance, the musicians in the market square play Ilabani's love song. Ninsekil briefly pauses, hearing it. Inkid doesn't notice his wife's unease, admiring the bracelet. Finally, he also catches the two. What a beautiful melody. If it's not Ilabani, he has a worthy rival. I don't know the composer, but the music is really enchanting. I have to go. Atab will look after you. He hugs her and tries to kiss her on the lips, but she turns away. I dislike farewells. He settles for kissing her on the cheek. External. Nippur. Akala's house. Garden. Evening. Enkid and Akala occupy reed armchairs placed at the table. They partake in the meal, using their hands and daggers to help themselves. Rumors circulate about your disappearance. It's quite a long story, but the bottom line is that everything has ended well. Is my daughter safe? Don't worry, she's perfectly fine. So why are you in our city? Enkid sets the copper plate with the lamb meat aside and proceeds to clean his hands with a cloth. I've been assigned to ensure the king's security during the full moon festival in Nippur. Akala puts his beer cup aside and scrutinizes Enkid. Our city has changed drastically. Robberies and worse crimes happen nearly every day. Who's responsible for all of this? Akala shrugs. I can't say for sure, but the city is teeming with Amorite agents. They won't dare approach the king, not even within a bowshot's distance. I'll take care of that. Akala sighs. When the king dissolved the council of seven priests and declared himself divine, he made many powerful enemies in our city. I hope you're not one of them. No, that's precisely why I'm warning you. Who should I be most cautious of? I suspect those who approach the king bearing offerings in priestly attire. Thank you. I'll stay alert. Kid rises from the reed armchair. It's getting late, and I require some rest. Of course, I've arranged a room for your repose. Internal. Nipper. Tavern in the remote outskirts. Night. A three-quarters full moon graces the sky, casting its radiance upon the city and the magnificent ziggurat of Nippur. Lipit meets secretly with Erlama. They engage in a discreet conversation, inclining their heads intimately toward each other. You have an opportunity to reckon with the king for all the, the humiliation of your folk. That's my sole aspiration, but how can we achieve it? Uh, the king's caravan will reach Nippur before the full moon. But the king is heavily guarded. Sure, but I've got a plan. I'll provide you with details later. First, inquire. Are you prepared? Urlama looks at Lippet, thinking about the proposal. You spill the beans first. Why do you want the king gone? If you and your folks pull it off, my father-in-law will become the regent for the young heir. What's in it for me? Gold up front and a shot at becoming Nipper's governor uh, later. I'm in, but you're pretty shady. You're a relative of the king, after all. You have no reason to worry. External, Mesopotamia, Nippur, day. Kid, clad in plain civilian attire, inspects the route the royal caravan will traverse. Kuda accompanies him. They examines the central gates, a wide street paved with fired clay bricks, and the two-story houses, identifying vulnerable points for a potential caravan attack. Moving through the streets, close to the main road, leading to the ziggurat, Enkid frequently pauses to observe. They make their way to the bustling marketplace, continuing to survey the crowd. People disperse in fear, avoiding eye contact with them. Approaching the cattle pen, Enkid assesses a restless herd of sharp-horned bulls and contemplates the wooden gates deeply. Internal. Nippur. Akala's house. Enkid's room. Evening. Enkid, seated at the table, seals a moist clay envelope containing a tablet. Akala sits across from him. He rises and addresses Akala. At dawn, send a trustworthy messenger to Ur. Akragal awaits its arrival. Don't worry, I have a dependable individual. External. Mesopotamia. Nippur. Noon. The city's herald trumpets announce the royal caravan's arrival. 
Enkid and Kuda approach the caravan on horseback. The vanguard of soldiers, armed with short spears and shields, enters the city first. Carts bearing archers follow them. The majestic royal carriage is protected by foot guards of the godlike king. Carriages carrying royal officials follow suit. At the rear, multiple mules carry water, supplies, and ammunition. Bringing up the rear is a contingent of archers. City dwellers abandon their tasks and gather on the main thoroughfare. Their curious eyes are fixed on the king's caravan. Nippers garrison warriors maintain order in the crowd, diligently preventing anyone from rushing ahead of the procession. External, Nipper, Marketplace, Cattle Pen, Noon. Upon hearing the herald's trumpets, Lippet in Bedouin attire with a face covering veil signals the Amorites. One of them hurries to the cattle pen's gates and the rest jump into the bull pen using tongs to painfully twist the bull's tails. The bulls grow furious. As the gates open, the enraged animals charge down the street towards the city's main gate. A whole herd rushes, sweeping aside everything in its path and causing immense panic. External, Mesopotamia, Nippur, Noon. Enkid is the first to detect an unusual noise, resembling the thundering stampede of a herd. Enkid and Kuda quickly ride towards the caravan, skillfully diverting the king's chariot into an adjacent alley off the main road. Shortly after, infuriated bulls charge onto the road, wreaking havoc as they trample everything with their hooves and horns. As the bulls thunder past, a dozen Amorites, including Ulama, traverse rooftops, converging on the king's chariot. In a nearby street, Amorite assailants hasten toward the royal carriage, wielding sword. Concealed within the commotion, the Amorites draw their short blades and, exploiting the chaos, dispatch the guards and race toward the king's carriage from the opposite side. A full-fledged battle erupts, with the royal defenders fiercely opposing them. Nevertheless, the Amorites manage to breach the chariot's defenses. Enkid and Kuda dismount from their horses. We're cornered. They've sealed off all the exits. We'll break through. A fierce battle unfolds. Amorite archers take positions on nearby rooftops, releasing arrows to incapacitate the king's defenders. Enkid's positioned archers along the caravan's route join the fray, quickly eliminating several Amorite archers. The Amorites cease firing toward the ground. Where the primary skirmish is taking place, Enkid notices Erlama issuing commands and moves toward him. Kuda confronts three Amorites simultaneously, showcasing remarkable skill and dexterity, leaving them struggling to defend themselves. The Lama vaults onto the king's carriage, dispatching two guards protecting the king and tearing through the carriage's canopy with his sword. He pulls aside the chariot's drapery, only to find it empty. Frustration and bewilderment overwhelm him. Their efforts have been in vain. Halt! Retreat! The Amorites find themselves trapped as Enkid's strategically placed warriors, alongside the royal fighters, swiftly close in on them. Kid leaps onto the carriage, engaging in a fierce duel. His agility and strength prove superior as he disarms Urlama, sending his sword clattering to the ground. Urlama resorts to his short blade. Witnessing the demise of the Amorites, fear flickers across his face. Surrender. You won't make it out alive. Urlama wears a sinister, predatory grin on his face. You won't see it happen. <laughs> Kuda also leaps onto the cart. In the next moment, Urlama thrusts a dagger into his own stomach and twists it. He falls to his knees and rolls to the side. Inkid shakes his head regretfully. My intention was to keep him alive. A dog's fate for a dog. Inkid, standing on the chariot, surveys the battlefield. He observes the carriages of the king's officials traveling along the main street. In one of them, the divine king and Akrigal are seated side by side. External, Nipper, Main Street, Noon. In a carriage drawn by a pair of horses, the king and Akrigal pass by a recently thwarted emirate attack. Gradually, the people begin to re-emerge onto the city's central street, curiously observing the caravan. Inkid just rescued you. It's fortunate you followed his advice and switched to my carriage. Determination shows on the king's face. Purge the city of them. Execute all rebels, including their families. It shall be done, my lord. What other warnings did Inkid provide? About the conspiracy involving the priests. They are plotting to assassinate you. 
What have I done to displease the priests? They are discontented with your leadership and seek to seize power. You know what to do? Of course. After a pause, the king issues an order. Upon our return to the capital, invite Enkid to meet with me. External. Nipper. Entrance to the Ebabar Temple. Evening. Enkid, adorned in the latest attire, attentively scrutinizes individuals as they approach the temple's entrance. When he detects a group of priests adorned in ritualistic garments, he discreetly signals a Kurgle's combatant. The priests are forcibly directed away from the temple entrance and subjected to meticulous searches. Enkid scans the assembly of spectators in front of him. He observes an individual garbed in Bedouin clothing, obscuring the lower part of his face with a scarf. When this person meets Enkid's gaze, he retreats a couple of steps and seamlessly merges into the throng. Internal, Ur, Palace, Bazi's Chamber, Day. Lipid garbed in Bedouin clothing, appears at the chamber's threshold. He briefly halts. Bazi demands sharply. Well, Enkid messed up everything. Orlob and his gang, along with their families, are gone. And the priests? They got a thorough check at the temple's gate, and any armed ones got taken out right there. It's a total loss. Bazi abruptly rises from the table, taking a few contemplative steps. I hope no one links you to the assassination attempt. No, I played it safe. And Kid strikes again. Lost in thought, he rubs his palms together. Put an end to him. Lipid Resolute responds. I shall kill him, and I shall relish every moment of it. Internal, or Ermesh's house, evening. At a decorated table sit two individuals, the portly Ermesh and the lavishly attired Lipid, a golden circlet adorning his head. I'm aware of Inkid's whereabouts. Lipid gazes at him questioningly. He will be in Larsa soon, commemorating his father's remembrance. Is he coming for sure? Absolutely. He will offer aid to the less fortunate in his memory. Lippet smirks cunningly. <laughs> Just assure me he won't come to harm. Fear not. Enkid will be delighted to reunite with um, his former schoolmate. When can I expect the agreed upon quantities of tar oil? Rest assured, if I've made a commitment, I'll honor it. External. Larsa, Abzu's house, courtyard, sunset. Enkid and a tab arrive at his father's residence, and the coachman parks the carriage nearby Kid steps out and dusts himself off, while Adab, leaning on his staff, descends gracefully behind him. You're truly commendable for honoring your father's memory. They make their way toward the front of the house. Adab halts and listens attentively. Unusually quiet. It's strange that no one is here to greet us. Indeed. Inkid takes the lead toward the house's entrance, but Adab stops him just as he's about to open the front door. Halt, I sense danger. Beware, it's a trap. The door swings open from within. Inkit draws his sword. Three burly assailants emerge from the house, their faces filled with menace. They quickly encircle Inkit, their focus fixed firmly on their target. Uratab, standing beside Inkit, grips his staff firmly. The coachman rushes to join them, brandishing a short blade. The clash of steel rings out across the courtyard as the battle begins. Inkit skillfully deflects blows with his sword, but the odds are stacked against him. The three warriors press forward relentlessly, coordinating their attacks. One of them strikes the coachman, sending him tumbling to the ground. Watab moves with nearly supernatural grace, wielding his staff in elegant, sweeping arcs to fend off the attackers. He adeptly protects Enkid, using his staff to disarm and incapacitate their foes. Lipid emerges from the house, watching with cruel satisfaction as his scheme unfolds. With renewed determination, Inkid advances, engaging in a fierce duel with the lead warrior. Their swords clash, sparks flying with each desperate yet purposeful strike. Sensing an opportunity, Ada precisely swings his staff, disarming one of the warriors and sending him crashing to the ground. The tide of the battle begins to shift. Fueled by Adab's support, Inkid gains the upper hand, dispatching one warrior after another, leaving them sprawled on the ground. Lipid's face contorts with anger and frustration. He steps forward, drawing his sword, ready to join the fray. He charges the blind servant, skillfully evading his staff, and impales him with his blade. Adab slumps lifeless. Lipid pivots, launching a ferocious assault on Inkid. He succeeds in swiftly cutting Inkid's cheek with a sudden strike. Inkid retreats and confronts Lipid with a determined gaze. Their swords clash fiercely, 
With a swift, calculated move, Inkid disarms Lippet, sending his sword clattering to the ground. Lippet stumbles back, defeated. Inkid points his sword at Lippet, triumphant. You shall not dare to spill royal blood. I will not forgive you for Adab's death. In a final act of desperation, Lippet reveals a concealed dagger and lunges at Inkid. Inkid strikes down Lippet, ending the conflict. Lippet falls in agony. Inkid kneels beside Adab as the old man weakly smiles and takes his last breath. Enkid presses his mentor's lifeless body against his chest. Internal, Ur, Palace, King's Throne Hall, Evening. Birches flicker, casting light upon a regal throne hall. The king, resembling a deity, reclines upon a magnificent ivory throne, seated in a grand mahogany armchair. Enkid, adorned in ceremonial attire, stands still, unmoving, with his head respectfully lowered. A fresh scar adorns his cheekbone. You know that my realm has long surpassed the borders and power of Sargon the Ancient. Series of shots. The Kingdom of Sumer and Akkad, towering cliffs in the northern regions. Flowing rivers teeming with barges and boats, vast fields adorned with ripe grain, extensive herds of domestic animals, bustling merchant caravans, construction of dams, disciplined armed soldiers, an imposing ziggurat, and a captivating harp adorned with a lion's head. I've expanded and enhanced the legacy left by my illustrious father. My realm is impeccably structured and resonates like a hop adorned with a lion's head. Internal Ur Palace, King's Throne Hall, Evening. After a short pause, Enkid summons his resolve and opts to speak to the king. Your rule is vast, your power unmatched. The king gazes at Enkid, examining him closely. Tell me, despite my best efforts, why has discontent and unrest arisen and spread in my kingdom? Inkid gazes directly at the king. The king responds with a subtle nod of approval. Your concern is valid. The world follows a mysterious order. The king listens closely to Inkid's words. Mesopotamia, summer, winter, series of shots. From the midst of the flames emerges the Sumerian symbol for 60, growing rapidly. There are ascending and descending cycles. Just as summer turns to winter, growth eventually gives way to decline regardless of the wisdom and nobility of our rulers. The backdrop shifts and the fire gives way to water, from which a new blue symbol of 60 emerges. Internal Ur Palace, King's Throne Hall, Evening. The King's attention deepens. And where are we now? During an ascending cycle, over the next 40 years, your realm won't encounter imminent dangers. What comes after that? The celestial bodies signal the onset of a downward cycle. A great king, regarded as the scheme and decree of the demon Namtar. Ning Kid lowers his head in a bow, but the king frowns in displeasure. He rises slowly from his throne and confidently descends into the hall, passing by. I'm like the demon Namtar, capable of molding people's fates. The king ponders as he approaches a small silver table where a large black ceramic vase is placed. The king then turns his gaze. Do you know the age of this vase? I estimate it to be around three millennia, belonging to the Samara culture. But no wonder you were regarded as one of the finest in your studies. The king approaches the throne and takes a seat on the third step, gazing into the distance with deep contemplation. Abruptly, he gestures for Enkid to occupy the lower throne step. Taken aback, Enkid complies, resting his hands on his knees. To his dismay, an astonishing event unfolds. The king ascends, descends three steps, and kneels before him. Enkid, with a pallid countenance, freezes in expectation. In a state of euphoria, Shulgi commences speaking, his speech tempo exceeding the norm. This is how Namtar lay before me, begging not to deprive him of power. Enkid instinctively swallowed the lump in his throat. Shulgi falls silent, his gaze enveloping Enkid like a python. He gradually stands up. After that, I became godlike. He sits down again on the third step of the throne. Are you afraid of death? No, my father taught me that dying with honor is more important than how you lived. I for you named you after Enkidu from the epic? Yes, and I am grateful to him as well. Do you remember Enkidu's fate? Of course. 
If I call you my friend, would you tread the path of Enkidu from the epic? Yes. And kid, my friend, it's time for you to venture into the realm of the ancestors preceding me. And kid looks at the king, his face paling, but his eyes filled with resolve. Choose the place, time, and method yourself. The king doesn't rush him. I've always dreamed of experiencing a moment of liberated flight. I choose the highest point within your vast kingdom. On the full moon, I will jump from it. So be it. Inkid gets up slowly. Your family will be provided for throughout their lives. External. Ur, palace. Cattle pen. Kuda presents Inkid. A red scar adorns his cheekbone with ten splendid riding horses. Inkid carefully assesses each horse, checking their teeth and affectionately patting them. Suddenly, Akergal and his group enter the cattle pen and approach Enkid. Word. They move away to ensure privacy. The Divine King informed me of your choice and instructed me to oversee its fulfillment. No need to worry. I will honor my commitment. Akergal gazes intently into the depths of Enkid's eyes, who remains unwavering. You should not have shed royal blood. I regret nothing. Who will train my warriors now? Don't fret. Kuda will handle it. Is he your friend? Yes, for nearly a decade. Akergul, hands clasped behind his back, takes a few strides, pauses, and then turns his gaze to Inkid. Are you aware that your another friend, Ormesh, disclosed your whereabouts to Lipit? Inkid, silent and astonished, offers a wry smile. A human is frail. I will forgive him, but I will erase him from my life. Akergul's gaze sharpens. Regarding your lifespan, it's quite limited now. How many days remain for me? We shall depart for the Cedar Land in three days. I will be prepared. And Kid bows before him. A Kurgle responds with a nod of his head. He departs with a dignified stride. Internal, Ur, in Kid's house, evening. In Kid enters the house, appearing more fatigued than ever. He gravitates toward the hearth, gazing into the flickering flames the soft, barefooted footsteps of Nine Sekil resonate from the upper floor. Inkid pivots in her direction. She hurries down to him and tenderly encircles her arms around his neck. My dearest husband, I am overjoyed by your return. A radiant smile graces Nine Sekil's face. Seems like a miracle has happened. The gods have heard my prayers. What do you mean? I have delay in my female cycle. I am pregnant. Are you sure? Yes, I will bear you an heir. Inkid's expression shifts as he absorbs the unexpected news. He takes her by the hand. I must tell you something. External, or Inkid's house. Garden, day. Inkid reclines in a wicker chair, a goblet of wine in hand. The scar etches his cheekbone. In the far off distance, the joyous cacophony of a lively crowd faintly echoes Ninsekil comes out of the house, approaches him. She kneels beside Enkid, embracing him tightly. She has teary eyes. Is there really nothing that can be changed? Enkid places the goblet on the small table next to him. The matter is settled. I have no other choice. He gently lifts Ninsekil onto his lap. But what about me? I mean us. She lovingly caresses her belly. My little fox, don't worry. You and our child are safe under the king's protection. The noise of the crowd quiets down as soon as musicians play Ilabani's captivating love song. I've been hearing this melody quite often lately. It's the most popular song in the entire capital. The music is truly enchanting. They quietly enjoy the melody. Inkid starts first the conversation. Apply with the law. Marry after five years. Our child requires a father. I'll wait for you five years. He gently strokes her belly. If a son is born, name him Balik. In the case of a daughter, bestow upon her the name Insha. I promise you this. Inkid takes the goblet and sips the wine, continuing to listen to the music. When are you leaving? In two days. Are you scared? Now, yes, but I'll handle it. Ninsekil rises from his lap and takes his hand. Come, my lion. I'll love you as if it's the last time. And Kid stands up and they share a passionate kiss. Internal. Ur. Tavern under a cane roof. Evening. 
and Kid and Amit sit at the table, silently drinking beer. Enkid has transformed. His head is shaved. His face is weary. The scar adorns his cheekbone. One of my friends betrayed me, and the other avoids meeting with me. Amit silently sips beer through a straw. Adab was killed right in front of me. My revenge was swift, but it didn't make me feel any better. Don't blame yourself. It is beyond your control. The kid's face shows sadness, weariness, and a strong resolve. Ninsa Keel is carrying my air. That's fantastic news. Why the lack of happiness? Amit locks eyes within Kid, who doesn't look away. May I ask you to raise my heir, be it a son or a daughter? Is everything so dire? Unfortunately, yes. Amit silently nods in agreement. Why did you shave your head? I always wanted to be the king's friend, and now I'm no longer his property, but his truly friend. Amit looks at him with fear. No. Don't tell me he requested that you endure the fate of Enkidu. Enkid grimaces bitterly. Indeed. However, now I've found the desire to live. I long to embrace my unborn heir. It's a mistake. A tyrant can't have friends. He just exploited your noble feelings. The matter is settled. I have no other choice. What did you promise him? At the full moon, I will jump from the tallest cliff in the land of cedars. I'll go with you. As you decide. Amit ponders, crossing his arms. Eventually, a cunning smile graces his face. I've got an idea brewing. There's a slim chance for your survival. Then Kid regards him skeptically. How slim are the odds? One in six, at best. External. Land of cedars, forest thicket, day. The eagle soars gracefully above the cedar forest. From a higher vantage point, we witness a group of about 10 valiant warriors trekking uphill through the woods. Among them is Akrigal, who walks alongside Enkid and Yumit. Enkid bears a sizable bag slung over his shoulder. Internal, Ur, Ilabane's covert residence. Evening, romantic meeting between Ninsikil and Ilabane. Both appear happy. Ilabane tenderly clasps her hand, gazing at her affectionately. She smiles tenderly at him. External. Ur, pier, ship, day. Ramesh avidly tallies the barrels of tar oil on the ship's deck. An avaricious smile wanders across his pudgy face. He quite merely pats his belly. Internal, Ur, palace, chef vizier's room, evening. Torches flicker casting light on Basie as he deposits handfuls of gold into a substantial chest. Contentment and joy grace his countenance. External, Ur, palace, cattle pen. Day. Kuda instructs the warriors, each holding their horses by the reins. He is dressed in new and expensive attire. In him one can sense authority and the ability to lead. External. Land of cedars, mountains, plateau, sunset. The eagle flies over the cedar forest. Enkid and Yumi, along with the Akrigol's group, are about to reach the summit of the mountain plateau. The eagle soars to the edge of the plateau with a steep cliff. External, land of cedars, mountains peak, night. A large full moon ascends, bathing the surroundings in its cool radiance. On the crag stands a mighty bonfire. Inkid dressed distinctively in a cloak-like garment contemplates the dancing flames. Yumit stands beside him. Akrigal approaches the two. Time is up. He leaves. Terrifying, almost like a nightmare. Yumit inspects Inkid's garment. Yank the rope's end, and the knot will untangle, transforming your cloak into wings, akin to a bird. Enkid tries to regain his rapid breath. His pulse is elevated. He perceives his father's voice echoing from bygone days. Remember, son, death is certain. Some squeal like pigs, but true warriors face it with dignity. Enkid approaches the precipice resolutely. With arms outstretched, he takes a daring leap. At first, he glides gracefully. Then he lets go of the rope. Soon, he maintains control of his flight as he soars under the radiance of the full moon. Kid's body remains undiscovered. People will speculate that he learned to soar like an eagle. To be continued.